The merger case we'll be looking at is regarding whether or not the radioactive waste disposal company Rockwell Hold Co., owner of Energy Solutions, should be allowed to purchase Andrews County Holding, owner of Waste Control Systems, WCS. The Department of Justice says that Rockwell should not purchase Andrews. To do so would harm competition in the market of low-level radioactive waste disposal and violate Section 7 of the Clayton Act. Rockwell Hold Co. and Andrews County Holdings argue that because there are other options for disposal of low-level radioactive waste, and because WCS is a failing business, that this is a special case and they should be allowed to go through with the merger. This decision is based only on radioactive waste generated by commercial entities and not the federal government. Recycling and waste disposal comes up in the news all the time in regards to global warming and environmental change. The disposal of nuclear waste is often mocked in the media as being nothing more than glowing green sludge dumped into rivers. Because of movies and media, there has been a lot of misinformation and fear developed around the nature of nuclear energy and its hazardous byproducts. The truth is much more complicated than this, and mostly beyond the scope of this presentation. But in order to understand the nature of the merger between two radioactive waste disposal companies, we need to know more about what market these companies operate in. We all experience a normal background dose of radiation simply by existing on the planet. Standing in the sun, eating a banana, or getting a dental x-ray all expose us to small levels of radiation. Higher, harmful levels of radiation can be caused by radioactive metals such as uranium, plutonium, and thorium, but many other elements can also emit radiation. Alright, so what exactly is radiation and how do these elements cause it? Let's go briefly back to science class. Atoms are made up of these small pieces called subatomic particles. The nucleus of an atom is made up of protons with a positive charge and neutrons with no charge. The nucleus is surrounded by negatively charged electrons. Atoms are considered stable when the particles are in balance and the atom can go along its way being hydrogen or carbon forever and ever. Some atoms may have an unstable mix and have trouble holding themselves together. They're called radionuclides. These atoms like hydrogen-3, tritium, carbon-14 or radiocarbon, and uranium-235 are prone to splitting up when exposed to free-roaming neutrons in a process called decay. When they split, the process isn't clean. It's more like snapping a cracker in half. You input some energy, and then you get two mostly even halves along with some crumbs and energy release in the form of cracking a sound. Atoms do the same thing. When a neutron is introduced, the radionuclide is broken into two smaller atoms, some crumbs in the form of alpha particles, a bundle of two protons and two neutrons, beta particles, electrons and positrons, and electromagnetic waves in the form of infrared, heat, x-ray, and gamma radiation. Different radionuclides decay at different rates. The rate of decay is known as an element's half-life, or the time it takes for one half of the total mass of a material to decay. Some things have a half-life of days, such as certain isotopes used in medical imaging, and some may take thousands or millions of years to fully decay, like carbon-14, which gives us the ability to accurately date certain organic material that's found in archaeological digs. The biggest dangers of radioactive waste are caused by decay. If ingested, alpha and beta particles can be hazardous to tissues, and gamma radiation has enough energy to pierce the nucleus of our cells and start a process that knocks pieces off of our DNA. This can cause harmful mutations and lead to cancer, and lead to lethal radiation sickness over time. Because of the dangers associated with decay and radioactive materials, they must be watched over carefully, and disposed of properly depending on their type. So what are the different kinds of radioactive waste? Radioactive materials need to be disposed of from many different streams. Different types of disposal are required for different wastes of different levels. The U.S. Nuclear Re Regulatory Commission splits waste up into three different official categories spent nuclear fuel, high-level radioactive waste, and low-level radioactive waste. Some people also refer to a very low-level waste, but this is not an official term recognized by the NRC. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission divides LLRW into four official classes which are divided by their radionuclide concentrations. A, the lowest concentration, B, C, and greater than class C. Radioactive material can be found in almost every household in the form of ionization smoke detectors. These smoke detectors use a radioactive isotope of americium-241 to help detect the presence of smoke in the air. Some high-end glowing watches also contain radioactive tritium to give a consistent green glow to their faces or numbers. The amount of radiation given off by these watches, even in extreme cases, has been found to be insignificant when compared to the background radiation that we're all exposed to every year. These very low-level radioactive wastes are considered safe enough to be disposed of in municipal waste dumps in normal quantities. The studies have shown that they're unlikely to cause any additional threat that would require them to be sent to any special sort of facility. 
Hospitals require the use of radioactive isotopes such as cobalt or iridium or iodine in their nuclear medicine sections. These materials and contaminated tools that have been exposed to the isotopes can remain radioactive for days or months. Most of these materials are considered low-level wastes. By far, though, most radioactive material comes from nuclear energy production. The byproducts of nuclear energy consist of spent uranium rods used in reactor cores, classified as spent nuclear fuel, and contaminated machinery, resin-covered filters, and even the dirt surrounding the site of the reactor. There is a steady stream of nuclear waste that flows from a power plant, and all of this needs to be safely stored and disposed of. Disposal is so important that six states, Maine included, will only allow a new nuclear power plant to be built if they already have a functional waste disposal plant. Because of the dangerous nature of radioactive materials, they must be disposed of properly while they're left to cool down. Depending on the category of LLRW, there are different methods available for proper disposal. Household items like watches and ionizing smoke detectors have such a small amount of radioactive material that they can be safely discarded in regular trash. Some of the medical waste has such a short half-life that it can be stored on site in a safe location for 10 times their half-life. So if a certain ha isotope has a half-life of 30 days, then it could be stored on site for about 10 months. This would leave only 0.01% of the original amount of radioactive material left in storage so that it could be disposed of with other hospital waste into municipal streams. Then we get into true LLRW that have a half-life long enough to warrant long-term disposal. These things are things like resins and filters, and even the dirt surrounding the nuclear reactor, like I said before. To be properly disposed of, these wastes have to be buried underground in special bunkers designed to keep it away from easy tampering and possible groundwater exposure. Class A, or low-level radioactive waste, can be disposed of with slightly less long-term plans as higher class B or C radioactive waste. Depending on how long they were used, some of these wastes are more contaminated than others, and may require disposal in a facility that can accept Class B or C waste, which requires steel-reinforced bunkers buried much deeper than Class A waste. All waste that's disposed of at these higher class facilities, due to regulations, must be disposed of in the same way. This means that even Class A waste that ends up at a facility that can dispose of B and C waste will have to be disposed of in a more costly way. A company can make an effort to avoid sending LLRW to Class B or C sites. Energy Solution owns a processing company in Tennessee that uses methods called concentration averaging, segmentation, and sorting and segregation in which higher class wastes, like the filters and even large metal machines, are shredded and mixed with lower level wastes and liquids until the average amount of the radionuclides are at a safer level. And then they're suitable for disposal in a Class A facility. Energy Solutions is the only processing company that also owns a disposal facility. Every U.S. state is responsible for their own LLRW disposal. They can either open up their own LLRW disposal facility or be in a compact agreement with a different state that has a facility. States that are in a compact agreement are allowed to exclude states that are not. This means that depending on where the nuclear waste was produced, the options for disposal are limited. Neither energy solutions or waste control specialists are licensed to handle the high-level wastes that are spotted all over the country or left sitting on the site of old nuclear power plants, sites to cool down where they sit under heavy surveillance. Because of this, the Department of Justice specifies that the merger case involving these two companies only deals in LLRW. Just how many places in the country can handle the disposal of these low-level waste streams? Four. Only four. That's right. For all of the LLRW produced in the United States, there are only four locations that this waste can go. The Energy Solutions Clive, Utah site and Barnwell, South Carolina site, both owned by Rockwell Holdco. The Waste Control Systems ex Exempt Cell in Andrews, Texas, owned by Andrews County Holdings. And the U.S. Ecology site in Richland, Washington, that's owned by Northwest and Rocky Mountain Compacts. This excludes out-of-compact waste. Because of the classification limits of disposal and state compact agreements, producers are limited on where they can dispose of waste. If the waste is processed before disposal, then this can expand the disposal options available to the company. If a facility is completely decommissioned, then sometimes the location of the waste products are limited due to the absolute cost of the disposal. Energy Solution claims that there are other methods of disposal available for consumers that would allow for competition after a merger takes place. They mention various self-help options that businesses can take, such as on-site storage of LLRW, burial on their own premises, or waste minimization. The United States refutes these methods quickly by suggesting that no nuclear plant would want to add to the cost of decommissioning by storing large amounts of LLRW on site, that burial would illegally turn the plant into an LLRW disposal facility itself, and that even with waste minimization, there is still a minimum possible amount of waste that will have to be disposed of. 
WCS can process A, B, and C waste, but they must dispose of all of it in the same way. The records show that all of these facilities, Energy Solutions, Clive Facility, U.S. Ecology, and WCS compete for disposal of low activity LLRW. Also noted by the United States is that WCS's higher concentration limits and extremely low prices make WCS a competitive threat to Energy Solutions in particular. High activity LLRW can be disposed of at WCS's compact waste facility, which allows for A, B, and C class waste. And so, given the above facts, a commercial generator wishing to dispose of higher activity LLRW has the following realistic options. Send the waste to Energy Solutions for concentration averaging and disposal at Clive, or send the waste to WCS for direct disposal in the compact waste facility. To quote the government opinion paper of the case, in fact, Energy Solutions is so confident that it offers a competitive alternative to WCS for disposal of higher activity LLRW that it has sued or threatened to sue both WCS and its customers based on this assertion. In 2015, Energy Solutions filed an antitrust claim against WCS asserting that its downblending process offers a competitive alternative for disposal of waste that would otherwise entirely be classified as Class B and C waste. Energy Solutions claimed that it serves as WCS's only competition in the market for disposal of Class B and C waste. To make matters more clear about the competitive nature of both companies, WCS charges the same amount for disposal as Energy Solutions does for down blending and disposal combined. Within the case document, the government provides values for the market share that each of the companies hold for out of compact waste. WCS holds 72.8% share, and Energy Solutions holds a 27.2% share of the market. Post-merger, Energy Solutions would hold a 100% share, resulting in a merger to monopoly. For lower activity operational waste, pre-merger, WCS has 7.7% share, and Energy Solutions has an 89% share. Post-merger, Energy Solutions would hold 96.7% share. According to the opinion paper of the Department of Justice, market concentration for high-level LLRW under the hirschfeld hirschman Index would increase after the merger to a maximum of 10,000, an increase of 3,957 points. The market disposal for lower activity operational LLRW would increase 1,370 to a post-merger HHI of 9,348. With these numbers, there's almost no question that a merger between these two companies would absolutely create a monopoly situation within the commercial waste disposal market. One of the other primary arguments for the merger is that WCS is a failing firm. They have had a very hard time establishing a market and are hardly able to hold themselves afloat. This is partially because over the years, companies are trying to produce less BC class waste for disposal, which eats away at WCS's profits. Because of the nature of their specialty in higher concentration LLRW, they have a very high overhead cost, and it's hard to keep up with these funds. To help keep themselves afloat, they have a loan of $85 million from a company called Val High. However, the government doesn't agree that this is necessarily proof that WCS is destined to fail, because they have historically always been able to pay all of their bills on time, both to Val High as well as for all of its utilities and property leases. The government also suggests that a future of more decommissioning projects is on the 20-year horizon, which could cost up to $50 billion total, 10% of which is estimated to go towards LLRW disposal. Power plants are very expensive to decommission and are required to establish a decommissioning trust fund before beginning operations. The process of decommissioning is given up to 60 years to complete. In conclusion, Section 7 of the Clayton Act prohibits a merger where the effect may be sub to substantially lessen competition or create a monopoly. The government doesn't have to prove this with certainty, but they also can't just say that there's a mere possibility either. They must prove a reasonable probability. In this case, the court ruled against the merger between Rockwell Holdco and Andrews County Holdings, and I think that given the overwhelming evidence that a merger would harm competition in such a highly concentrated market, that this is the correct decision to make.